Happy day to you, our viewers, and welcome to Women on the Watch, powered by the Shapers Act. At Women on the Watch, we are committed to exposing scripture-based and time-tested principles for practical application to modern-day issues of personal development and relationship management. My name is Wonola Adetayo, and our scripture for today will be taken from Mark chapter 9 and verse 43. Mark chapter 9 and verse 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. And our case study is still that of Sapphira, the wife of Ananias, as documented in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Our episode for today is titled, Flawed Females and the Flawless God. Last week, we looked at how looking good may be bad business as we examined the flaws of Sapphira, the wife of Ananias. And in last week's episode, we defined character flaws using the acronym BEAD, which stands for blemishes, imperfections, and defects in our personalities and in our character. We learned from Safira's experience that allowing our flaws to fester unchecked can lead to very disastrous consequences. It is for this reason that today's episode is devoted to examining the consequences of unmanaged character flaws. And thereafter, we will look at curbing strategies that will help us to tame and possibly eliminate our character flaws. Our story for today is the story of Safira, as documented in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. According to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, Safira and her husband Ananias were members of the early Christian church in Jerusalem. Safira and her husband were a part of the faithful baptized followers of Jesus Christ. This couple was also numbered among the powerful caring community of believers during their time. Whilst the name Safira means beautiful or pleasant, her action on this fateful day was far from pleasant. Safira and her husband belonged to a community of believers that held all things in common, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 44, and Acts chapter 4, verse 32. It was therefore not surprising that Safira and her husband were prepared to sell their land and donate to the community as this was the general practice within that community. It was therefore an unexpected and sad situation that this couple planned a conspiracy together to deceive the community by holding back part of the proceeds whilst lying that they had given the full amount of the sale of their land to the community. On this fateful day, Safira's husband arrived earlier than his wife and proceeded to hand over the proceeds from the land sale to Apostle Peter. Being prompted by the Holy Spirit, the Apostle said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep part of the price of the land? He went further to declare that the land was that of Ananias and even the proceeds of the land also belonged to Ananias. Apostle Peter further declared that the attempt to deceive the church regarding the proceeds of the land was a sin against the Holy Spirit. Upon hearing this judgment, Ananias died instantly and his body was carried out by the brethren for immediate burial. 
After three hours of this incident, Safira arrived without prior knowledge of what had happened to her husband. The apostle questioned her about the exact price for which they sold the land, and she joined her husband in their conspiracy of deception by telling a lie about the price for which they sold the land. Apostle Peter therefore said to Sapphira in Acts chapter 5 and verse 9, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those that buried your husband are at the door, and they shall carry you out. Upon making this pronouncement, Sapphira died instantly, and the young men that buried her husband picked her body and buried her with her husband. What a tragic end to the life of a couple who were members of the community of believers. The terrible sin that this couple committed is not in holding back some of their proceeds from the land sale, but their conspiracy to deceive the community. They were more concerned about looking good outwardly without adequate attention to being good before God. Sadly, Safira and Ananias became the first couple to die in one day for the terrible sin of conspiracy to lie to the brethren without realizing they were treading on dangerous grounds. May the Lord help everyone struggling with character flaws with the courage to eliminate the character flaws before they bring tragic damage to such lives. So we start by looking at the consequences of the unmanaged flaws of deception, which is what happened to Safira. According to David Adams, he says, and I quote, there's no worse flaw in man's character than that of wanting to belong. The true flaw in Safira's character was the desire to belong which led her into the sin of deception. She and her husband wanted to look good like Joseph or maybe she even wanted a new name like they gave Joseph the name of Barnabas. Is it even possible that they had an unholy competitive spirit which made them to want to look like or to beat what uh, the, the, the man had done, which made them to give him the name Barnabas. But whichever of these flaws, because Safira refused to tame them, it destroyed her life. So we are going to look now at the consequences of allowing our character flaws to fester rather than dealing with them decisively. And we will look at five consequences. Consequence number one is self-deception. What is self-deception? When we are deceived into thinking that no one will ever find out our plots and our weaknesses, then that is self-deception. It happened to Safira. Both herself and her husband, they were deceived into thinking no one will find out their plots. They forgot completely about the God factor. You see, the longer we allow a character flaw to fester, the stronger that character flaw becomes, and then it takes a life of its own, and the individual becomes the victim and can no longer control that flaw. That is why we're told in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 13, evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse deceiving and being deceived. You see, on the outside, Safira and her husband, they looked as good as Barnabas, but on the inside, they were as different as night and day. But Safira had fallen into self-deception, thinking that no one will find her out. So it is with all those that excuse their flaws. That's what happens when you excuse your flaws, rather than dealing decisively with them, you become deceived by yourself. The second consequence of not dealing with character flaws is that it pushes people into sin. 
Once a person is caught in the web of self-deception, she loses control and the fear of God is no longer a factor, especially when the flaw festers without apparent consequences or exposures. It happened to Samson. He continued because he felt that, you know, even after he had committed the, the sin, he still went and he was strong and he was able to still uproot uh, at the gates. He felt that he had not lost spiritual strength, okay? So, so, so when we tolerate uh, flaws and, you know, flaws in our character, what it does is it makes us to become deceived and then it pushes us into sin. In the case of Safira, the love of money, and the desire for the praise of men led Safira to agree with her husband and they hatched out a deceptive plot. You see, that's why James tells us of the impending end of not checking the flaws in our character. It leads to sin. James chapter 1 verses 14 and 15. James 1 14 and 15 it says, When every man is tempted, when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed, then when lust are conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. So the second consequence is sin. The third consequence is exposure. In Luke chapter 8, verse 17, it is written that nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. You see, like many believers, it is highly possible that Safira and her husband, they knew this, but they had become so consumed with the praise of others that they forgot that the only one whose praise really matters is the Almighty God. Or perhaps maybe they thought, you know, that the exposure will only be in eternity. And so they were hoping that, you know, before we will leave here, there will be opportunity for them to repent. David had the same erroneous thinking. He impregnated another man's wife <laughs> and to prevent people from knowing so that there will be no public exposure, he decided to terminate the life of Uriah until God sent prophet Nathan to tell him that, you know what, all your sins are naked before God. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 tells us, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. My prayer for you and for me is that as many of us that are struggling with character flaws, that we think are covered and that no one can see, may we never, ever <laughs> find ourselves in public exposure. I pray we will find the grace to take decisive steps to eliminate our flaws before we become a spectacle for the world to see, just like Samson became a spectacle for the whole world to see. The fourth consequence of not taming our character flaws is judgment. It's judgment. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17 tells us, the judgment will begin in the house of God amongst us believers. It was the Holy Spirit that revealed to Peter the lie of Sapphira to teach us believers a harsh lesson about the importance of integrity in the life of a believer. Just like God revealed to Elisha about Gehazi's deception in 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 25 and 26. You see, whatever we are, whatever we own, they belong to God. Sapphira failed to realize this or omitted to warn her husband about this. Furthermore, their failure to realize this caused them to forget about the intents of our heart that are naked before God. <laughs> God had to judge them very harshly. Why? To cleanse his church. According to John Maxwell's leadership Bible, it says, and I quote, God had to surgically remove the spiritual cancer from the church by taking their lives. As many people that saw the consequence of sin, in the life of Safira and her husband, <laughs> the reality of the power of God to judge his church dawned on them. We also must learn from this experience and denounce our character flaws before they devour us. The Bible says, though hand joined in hand, the wicked shall not escape. This takes us 
to the fifth and the last of the consequences of not taming our character flaws. And that is bad legacy. Bad legacy. Safira and her husband, oh my God, would continually be remembered as dishonest believers who lost their lives wanting to look good without being good. They wanted to appear generous without truly being generous. They wasted opportunities and resources that God entrusted them with simply for a selfish ambition of looking good. What a tragic end for a character flaw that could have been dealt with. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 19, verses 22 and 23, the desire of a man is his kindness. A poor man is better than a liar. And Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 1a says, a good name is better than precious ointment. Now that we have looked at five terrible consequences of not managing or not taming our character flaws, we will now look at how can we curb these character flaws? What are the curbing mechanisms? You see, we serve a flawless God. Yet, our flaws are a continual reminder that we are flesh and blood. We should do to our flaws, deal with them, separate from them, so that we can continually aspire to be like our flawless God. So what are the steps that we can take? The first step is to learn not to dismiss our character flaws as if we are helpless. If somebody says you are struggling with anger, admit it. Don't say you are the people just getting me upset. If somebody says you are struggling with intolerance, admit it. You see, once we can identify our flaws, immediately we notice that they violate scripture principles. We must immediately acknowledge them as sins that need to be washed away by the blood of Jesus. So we will quickly examine what are five steps that we can use to overcome our character flaws. Step number one, fear God. You see, if Ananias and Sapphira had the fear of God as uppermost in their hearts, it would have been very easy to curb their character flaws. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 23, the fear of the Lord tended to life. He that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. The fear of the Lord will protect you from being visited with evil. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding that is in Psalm 111, verse 10. So you want to curb your character flaws, fear, fear God. Be afraid of him. Know that he can see what no man can see. Know that he's with you wherever you hide. Know that the thoughts and the intents of your heart are open to him. The second step in curbing our character flaws is to be intentional. Be intentional. What does that mean? It means own your flaw. Don't live in denial. Don't excuse your character flaws. Take ownership of your character flaw. One of the ways to take ownership is to review the impact of your flaw on others. We see a very good example in Christ. When our Lord Jesus denied, I mean when Peter denied Jesus three times, the Bible recollects that his heart was in pain. Why? He looked at Jesus and said, oh my God, three times I have denied my master. He looked at the implication and the impact of that flaw. What was Peter's flaw? Fear. He had a fear. If I admit that I know this one, what are people going to do to me? But instantly when he looked at the impact that that flaw had on our Lord Jesus Christ, he owned his problem. If Sapphira had thought about the injustice and treachery of deceiving Apostle Peter. She might have caught the unholy desire, most especially when God gave her that opportunity. Because when she came back, the husband had already died. And God gave her a second chance to be able to admit to Peter that, oh, I'm sorry, we had a plan. But she did not. She did not because she did not think of the impact. She didn't own 
her flaw. She excused her flaw. So we need to intentionally, if we want to curb your flaw, intentionally determine the traits that you want to imbibe in order to curb or eliminate that character flaw. What does that take? We must begin to intentionally study scriptures that are relevant to addressing our flaws. If your flaw is fair, you have to begin to look at all the fear not. What has God said about fear not so that we use that to work against that character flaw of being fearful. If it is envy of others, begin to look at scripture passages that address that issue. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Romans 12 and verse 2, and be, ye, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It requires a recalibration of our minds. And some of these flaws also can be helped when we pray about our flaws to the, through the power of the Holy Spirit. When we pray through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will help us to flush these flaws out of our system. Now, this takes me to step number three in curbing our flaws. What's the step number three? Practice self-discipline. Don't wait for others to discipline you. You see, Ananias and Sapphira, they waited, and unfortunately, that discipline was instant judgment. We need to examine ourselves regularly so that we can tame our fleshly lusts that masquerade themselves as character flaws. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, he says, I keep my body under. This is Apostle Paul. And I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a cast away. Keep a daily journal to track your progress on the journey to mastering the flaw. 1 Corinthians 11, 28a says, let a man examine himself. So when you keep a daily journal, you will track it. Am I growing? Am I getting better? Job 36 verse 10 says, he opened also their ear to discipline and commanded that they return from iniquity. So discipline yourself. How else can you discipline yourself? By fasting. When we fast, it can help to curb our fleshly lusts. So you can embark on periodic fasting to flush out the flaw if the flaw is too stubborn. After all, Matthew 17, 21 says, How be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. There are some of our character flaws that we need to use fasting to flush them out of our system. And now we look at step number four. How do we curb our character flaws? Number four, remain humble. <laughs> we never ever get to a point where we cannot fall. You see, as long as we are in the flesh, we remain vulnerable to flaws. And flaws can cause us to sin. That is why James chapter 4, verse 6b, James 4, 6b says, God resisted the proud, but he gave it grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. So remain humble. Don't say, oh, I've overcome that one. That's the kind of error that Samson made. Samson was very proud. He thought he had all the power. Nobody can mess around with me. Unfortunately, that was the end of his story. What is step number five? In curbing our character flaws. Number five, be accountable. You see, lone rangers are in grave danger. God provided us families, provided us the church, you know, provided us spouses, siblings, you know, so that we don't live life as lone rangers. Samson, unfortunately, was a lone ranger. Safira and Ananias, there was nobody to hold them accountable. If you want to curb character flaws, you need an accountability partner to help with the flaws. There must be someone who can call you to order. There must be someone who can discipline you when it becomes necessary. It may be your pastor. It may be your friend. It may be your spouse. It may be an elder. I have friends that can call me to order when I'm going on the right path. They can tell me, Wano, you need to stop this. And of course, I have parents. I have elders in the Lord who can call me to order. We all need accountability partners. Now, what do we do in curbing these challenges in our character? You must discuss this problem truthfully 
with your accountability partner and you must ask them for help. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 10, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. Woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath another to help him up. Thank God in the case of David, God sent prophet Nathan to him and David cried out. The God said, you know what? This is the judgment that is going to happen. And he served his punishment. David was accountable to God. He served his punishment, his discipline. And immediately he, re he made sure that that character flaw in him was removed completely. He never repeated that error. Proverbs 15 verse 12 says, A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. If you really, really want to curb or eliminate character flaws, you have to be willing to take feedback, whether negative or positive. Take the feedback. Be willing to be corrected. Be willing to, to work with people when they say to you there is a habit in your life that is making people uncomfortable, that is not speaking well of you. You need to be willing to be corrected and you need to be willing to work on it. Brethren, in today's episode of Flawed Females, I'm hoping that through the story of Safira, we have been able to revise for us the five consequences of unmanaged character flaws. And we saw that self-deception is one of them, sin is one of them, exposure is one of them, judgment is one of them, and a bad legacy. I wonder how many people have a daughter today and they want to name that daughter Safira. Okay, we have also looked at five ways of curbing character flaws, which include fear God, be intentional, practice self-discipline, remain humble, be accountable to man, and be accountable to God. As we conclude this episode of Flawed Females and the Flawless God, using Safira as our case study, it is our sincere hope that each and every one of us will no longer tolerate our character flaws, but we will confront them and we will correct them. You see, even our churches, family members and friends are enjoined to confront and correct our character flaws in love. If confrontation is not accepted, <laughs> we need to separate ourselves from those persons who refuse to work on their character. Otherwise, they will infect and destroy everything that they come in contact with. This is the word of God. The confrontation process takes a lot of wisdom, takes a lot of courage, and eventually it requires open disclosure if the culprit refuses to be repentant. Those who sin rebuke before all that others may fear. That is the word of the Lord. Till I come your way next week, same time, on the same station. This is Wanola Adetayo, the shaper, encouraging you to confront that character flaw today. And as you do, I want to trust the power of the Most High God to support you in that process so that you become a better person for Christ. God bless you very richly.